This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the third edition of our Carbon Smackdown series. My name is Jeff Miller and I'm Head of Public Affairs. Today's topic is wind, something that seems like such an easy answer to so many of our energy problems, but as our speakers, uh, lab scientists Glenn Delbaca and Ryan Weiser will show us, the wind option is a lot more complicated than we think. It's still hopeful, but a lot more complicated. So we're going to start with Glenn. Please welcome him. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Okay, uh, I want to talk about uh, today a project that uh, we started uh, way back in the early 2000s uh, to build an, a vertical axis wind turbine. So those of you who uh, have a bit of rebel in you, you might be interested in this, uh, in this topic. Uh, it's uh, a project that's jointly with Empire Magnetics of Roanoke Park, uh, and they're uh, working on uh, the alternator for it, and the State Rocket Center in Mias, Russia. This is a program funded by the Department of Energy. Uh, uh, initially uh, to uh, employ Russian scientists who are in their weapons program. And uh, the State Rocket Center is the, uh, it has the assets of NASA, basically, and they build the submarine launch ballistic missiles for Russia. And uh, so we had 100 or so guys uh, from over there working at various times with different engineering expertise. If you want to reach me, there's my name and email number. And, uh, the company in Russia is uh, the State Rocket Center Vertical now that's been formed uh, to commercialize the technology in Russia. So just so you know right away what we're talking about, this is a shot in Russia near the South Ural State University. Uh, that's what the turbine looks like uh, deployed there. This isn't a particularly good wind site, but there's an educational institution next door. And uh, there's a, a very nice monument to Kurchatov, the father of the uh, Russian atomic bomb. Uh, <laughs> Let's, let's go back, <laughs> let's go back uh, and uh, take a moment to uh, just reinforce uh, the impacts of uh, climate change. And uh, this one, of course, is close to home. This is uh, the meter or so that many believe is built into the system already. Uh, and what we see is that this meter sea level rise that's likely coming is uh, going to flood uh, Central Valley up to Walnut Grove or so. Uh, and this will probably occur during some massive uh, spring uh, storm that will start to melt and run off and, and take out the, the levees. But we have a tremendous amount of infrastructure work to do if we're going to protect uh, a lot of the low-lying uh, Bay Area areas. And so it's urgent that we start moving on. Now, in the last interglacial, there was a six-meter uh, sea level rise. And, and here is Florida uh, you know, with a sea level rise forecast at about five meters in 100 to 200 years. And as you can see, the, you can imagine the infrastructure projects that would be necessary to actually protect uh, the massive population centers that are down there. And they're basically uh, out of reach, I think. I think, you know, these are infrastructure projects that will never, you know, they'll maybe start, they'll do some, but by and large, people are going to have to migrate. And, and, and this kind of reminds me of the, uh, Florida reminds me of the Air Florida flight that left Washington, D.C. in uh, uh, I think it was 1982, and it was a real snowy day, and everybody was going down to Florida for uh, uh, a little vacation. And uh, they were on the runway in Dulles, I mean at uh, National, and uh, the uh, pilot made a very bad error to take off into this very, very icy conditions, and that 30 seconds later after liftoff, that plane crashed. And, and during the course of the run-up to the crash, the pilots were aware that something was not quite right. But they had a policy of, you know, they were going to set the engine levels at this level because that was sort of company policy and, and all the policies. And anybody who know, who's in an engine and, and the airplane gets in trouble, you know, in an airplane and the airplane gets in trouble, you jam the throttles all the way forward. Okay, and, and this is what I'm hoping that we'll realize is that, you know, we won't go back and ask who are they saving the engines for uh, on climate change because this crash will occur in 30 to 300 years. Uh, but nevertheless, it's coming, and we have to push throttles all the way forward right now, I think, uh, in order to do this. And so this means doing everything we can, as Berkeley Lab is right now. 
Uh, just a reminder, this is total sea ice. Uh, I kind of keep track of what's going on on the Arctic uh, sea ice levels. And as you can see, this is uh, accounting for the thickness of the ice. It's a uh, model from the University of Washington that's published on the National Snow and Ice Data Center. You can see we're, we're right here in this sort of catastrophic, could be a very catastrophic loss of, of sea ice right now. Um, and uh, that just uh, accelerates the process. So we need to do everything we can. So let me go back and talk about this project, uh, which started as a non-proliferation program project in 93. Uh, it was one of several US government projects at the time that was with the former Soviet Union. Uh, and there are many that are ongoing. And Thomas Turok, who's in the audience, uh, I believe, I saw Thomas a moment ago, uh, is the manager of the program now. I was the manager uh, a while back. And if you're interested in working uh, in some of the former Soviet uh, Union countries, you might chat with him. Uh, we use the lab connections to industry and to the newly independent state scientists to build these uh, coalitions. And then we required the US industrial partner to match uh, the program dollars. And so this effort was about two million of DOE money and about two million effort from our industrial partner over six years. And about 70% of the DOE money went to uh, the Russian scientists. Uh, we designed this unit uh, for the urban environment. Uh, we designed it for low noise and ease of manufacturing. Uh, and the ease of manufacturing, I think, will be important perhaps in uh, developing world applications because we'd like to actually transfer most of the manufacturing uh, into uh, those locations so that they have an economic basis for uh, developing these uh, uh, wind turbines. Uh, five units came here in December uh, to Berkeley. And now we're testing this under the Technology Commercialization Fund program, which Cheryl Frajadakis' department uh, manages. And uh, we're really pleased to have those resources. Thank you, Cheryl. Let's see, next slide. OK, uh, just a reminder for those of us who love the distributed grids ideas that electricity goes both ways, and the cheapest grid is the one you don't have to build. And uh, so uh, when we start thinking about plugging in our electric vehicles, we're going to wonder, where is this extra energy coming from? Uh, vertical axis turbines are a possibility. Um, they're um, good for small wind, we believe. Uh, there are two-dimensional airfoils. Here's one right here. Um, this is a turbine from the unit, a uh, turbine blade from the unit. And it is, uh, you can see a two-dimensional form, relatively easy to work up in a fiberglass shop, and uh, can be manufactured with uh, modest uh, technology. Uh, the airfoils are supportable at both ends, so you can get some strength. And we're all also in the vertical uh, mode able to use a large diameter alternator and get to higher voltages and use less wire. And the vertical machines should be good, uh, good in gusty low wind conditions, which are those that you expect in, uh, in an urban environment and with lower towers. And in addition, uh, the uh, blade speeds are lower, so we have a lower noise. Uh, uh, unit and uh, the impact uh, with any object that's flying in the air is also lower. Uh, let me put this in uh, context of uh, our familiar human development index graph here uh, that I think was just shown by Ashok a while back. And here's the annual energy output of the unit we're talking about today. It's just right about at the knee of the uh, human development index in terms of per, uh, per capita. <laughs> So it'll produce, along with a solar cell, most of the energy typical households should be able to, uh, to need. This is the design point uh, it, with relation to other wind turbines out there. This is the theoretical curve of the maximum energy you can get out of the wind. Here's the uh, efficiency, uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. Uh, and down here is the tip speed ratio. This is how fast the blade is going through the air relative to the wind speed. And most modern turbines operate up here around 50%. Uh, the big horizontal machines that Ryan will be talking about later on. So they're very efficient units, but they run at tip speed ratios of seven or so. So in a uh, 25 to 30 mile an hour wind, uh, the tips are moving uh, in, in uh, 200 to 300 mile an hour range, depending on the unit. And we designed down here to be at about two and a half times wind and, and get efficiencies about uh, 35 to 40%. And we believe we're there actually. The uh, project started off with uh, scientists modeling different blades. Uh, in Russia, here's the uh, stainless steel blades uh, that were uh, built up uh, for test in the hydro facility that I'll show in a moment. Uh, this is the 
helicopter factory in Kumertau in Bashkortostan in Russia uh, that is uh, putting, building up some of the first test prototype units. And of course, uh, all the blades were designed using uh, most of the modern uh, engineering techniques to look uh, for stresses and failure rates. This is the kind of facilities we had available for us. This is about, uh, oh, about 100 feet high right here. This is a water tube right here that goes around, and here's a huge propeller. They open up a dam and turn on the power and start turning this guy uh, and start a water flow. They get a very pure water flow through here, and then they put the blades inside uh, that tunnel. As you can see right here, here's one of the mounted blades, and they're able to put a fair number of diagnostics uh, around this, and then they scale from uh, water flow to airflow uh, to get what the behavior is in air. And we learned a great deal about the the absolute correct airfoil to use uh, in the project uh, using this. And it was also tested in wind tunnels. The unit itself starts at about two to three meters a second in a four degree angle of attack. Here's the shape of the profile. And Empire Magnetics has developed a pancake alternator right here, permanent magnet alternator uh, that sits in the unit. Uh, and as is, uh, by and large, there's one moving part, which is the rotor, uh, because the uh, alternator is attached to the rotor. Uh, here is the first Alpha unit that was built. This was uh, in Russia. This is the uh, shake stations for the submarine launch ballistic missiles for the Soviet Union, and they did the shake testing there on the unit. Uh, and here's the uh, computed power curve uh, showing that uh, we kick in at about three meters a second with about 100 watts and uh, achieve about 3.4 kilowatts uh, at uh, uh, 11, 12 meters a second. I'm sorry, what's that? The curve turns over, but there's no data. Oh, this right here? Oh, uh, you, you're talking about this? This is computed, OK? And so what actually we do is past here, we break the unit, because there's so little wind uh, that it's not worth withstanding the dynamic forces. And so what we do is just shut the unit down, OK? Th that's part of the control strategy for the unit. Yeah, and, there's, there, there, uh, and uh, um, these data points we have to reproduce now uh, here in the United States. Uh, just to give you an idea of the energy output, we're talking about uh, being designed by and large for class two wind, which is like coastal California and ridgeline California. Uh, we're talking about 4,350 kilowatt hours per year and about uh, $1,000 worth of energy at uh, 24 cents a kilowatt hour. But now I'm paying 47 cents a kilowatt hour when my daughters come home and, and leave on the, uh, the flat irons. Uh, because the rates are that high. And, and so I think we're actually competing, you know, to take energy off the top uh, and competing uh, at uh, very high energy rates. And anywhere in the world where people are running diesel generators, for example, to bring in their power, they're paying about 50 cents a kilowatt hour. So that's really the competition uh, in terms of economics. Uh, there's two versions of the unit. Um, one that has uh, these rings right here for structural stability on top and bottom, like the one you saw in the picture. And this one right here, uh, which has struts, and we're going to go with this unit uh, configuration uh, for some structural resonance reasons that you'll see in a moment. Uh, we also, under the program, built a 30 kilowatt unit. And this is sitting uh, in a steel factory in Chelyabinsk, Russia, uh, and has been erected over the winter. And I think they just got a few turns out of it uh, the other day. Uh, but uh, basically, the Russians are out of money, uh, and uh, I don't know what's going to happen to the 30 kilowatt unit right now. Uh, one of the major problems that comes up in uh, the course of doing uh, vertical axis wind turbines is the structural resonance. And this is an exaggerated, uh, highly exaggerated uh, uh, visualization of the modes. This uh, mode right here, and th these lead to fatigues that limit the lifetime of the unit. Uh, and what we want is very high lifetimes and to kind of avoid these resonance modes. Uh, and so this is a mode right here that is interactive with the tower. And this is a mode that's almost purely a, uh, uh, it's with the tower a little bit, but it's almost purely a blade mode. And uh, so these are the computed uh, displacements versus frequency. Uh, and uh, so we wanted to verify those here in California. And one of the reasons that we also went to the second unit design is to uh, the, raise this mode out of the operating range of the turbine. And we've done that. So this one right here, that's mode one. OK, this is done in Fresno at Tashjian Towers. Uh, it's being driven by an eccentric right now just to get the structural uh, quantities uh, right. 
And so that's the mode that you saw that would be the tower interaction mode, and that's relatively easy to fix. And then the next mode is uh, the wobbling back and forth mode, and we'd like to just avoid that because we don't want to fatigue the blades as much. Uh, we want to minimize the fatigue load on the blade. And there she goes, right there, right there. And so you can see the oscillations going. Now, this has all been computed and, and designed to withstand this over the lifetime of the turbine. Uh, however, we'd like to uh, um, avoid this mode totally, and we will. Okay, and this is the unit running at 145 RPM. Uh, you might just notice that the blade kind of disappears against the sky when it's uh, going that fast. So this is totally balanced now and, uh, you know, in, in full speed mode. And that's about the speed that it runs at when it's generating uh, its uh, maximum power. So um, we're going to start a test program under the uh, Small Wind Certification Council standards adopted by OEA in January. Uh, this uh, standard applies to turbines that are less than 200 square meters uh, in swept area. And uh, the SWCC is going to be an independent certifier, and they're going to provide uh, a placard that goes on the unit on all small wind turbines that go through their test program. And the unit will placard, uh, sort of like a consumer reports, it'll placard the power of the unit at 11 meters per second wind, uh, the annual energy output, uh, assuming a 5 meter per second Raleigh distribution for the wind. And that's what uh, you saw calculated earlier for this unit at about 4,300 or so. Uh, the sound level, which is the less than 5% threshold at 60 meters, um, and uh, this was an item that um, I think is in the favor of uh, horizontal wind machines because um, they're, they're considerably noisier, particularly when they're changing direction, and one of the reasons they're not widespread in urban environments. And then the cut-in wind speed for the production of power. Then we'll do a 2,500-hour endurance test, and 25 of those hours will have to be greater than 15 meters a second. And this standard generally uses the uh, IEC standards uh, with some relaxations. Uh, uh, they're not quite as stringent as the big turbines are. And this is likely to be used by the states for rebates. Uh, several states are already saying uh, they're going to use this uh, to determine whether rebates will be given. So our first place uh, that we're going to install, which will be at the end of the month or the very beginning of August, is in the Sassoon Bay, uh, a really nice windy location at the Marine Reserve, um, you know where the mothball fleet is out there? And this is a National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration buoy. One of these has been put aside for us, uh, and this tower will come off and the turbine will go up on top of there, and it'll be sitting out here in very clean wind uh, and relatively low altitude. And we have another site uh, in the Bay Area, um, and we've been working with the city of San Francisco on that. Uh, and that'll probably get uh, installed sometimes uh, in August. Okay, so uh, I'm going to end with a little bit of the market work that Ryan did actually at the very beginning of this project. Uh, he worked with Global Energy Concepts and uh, you know outlined what the market was um, for these units. And in 2004 or so, I think this was data from the American Wind Energy Association, grid connected homes of 15 million units potential. This is where there's wind and where uh, you know, there are people, okay? So uh, the U.S. market potential for, uh, has grown 78% in 08. So the growth rate for small wind is right now staggering, okay? And we expect that it'll stay that way. And if this kind of growth rate, 80% to 100% growth rate continues, uh, then uh, perhaps a WIA's goal uh, will be met, which is one third of this potential of this 16 million wheels, which, uh, which is 50,000 megawatts. Uh, by 2020, and it would have to grow at this rate to make 2020, by the way, uh, which is 3% of domestic electricity demand. Now, we want 20% renewables or wind, and Ryan's going to talk about the other 17% in a minute uh, with a bigger chunk, but this is still a reasonable chunk if we can get the penetration of small wind uh, to this level. So we're on, a, on track right now to 1. 1,700 uh, megawatts by 2013. And uh, anyhow, if this is all realized, this would be sales of about a billion dollars and 10,000 people employed. So uh, in the work that Ryan did, uh, he also outlined uh, where we had to be price-wise. This is the knee of the uh, photovoltaic uh, history. In other words, the number of units shipped versus uh, the price of the unit. And as soon as they got down to around four bucks a watt, it took off. And now we're way off this curve, I imagine, a long, long way. Uh, but this was uh, where we were shooting for uh, with regard to uh, installed costs. 
there are barriers to uh, the overall growth um, of small wind, uh, particularly in urban areas, mostly uh, prohibitive zoning regulations and height restrictions. But California just passed a law guaranteeing that if you have one acre, you can put up, I believe it's an 80-foot uh, tower. And if you have five acres, you can put up a 100-foot tower. And this is a uh, guaranteed uh, uh, right that you have. Um, the San Francisco Urban Wind Task Force met uh, over the last couple of years, and San Francisco has streamlined uh, the permitting process for wind to the same as solar. And they continue to maintain an interest in developing urban wind uh, in San Francisco, and we're happy to be working with them on that. Uh, another issue is low resolution resource assessments. A number, in other words, finding out exactly what the wind is likely to be at your house so you can make a decision about the economics. Uh, and there's few off the shelf inverters for grid tie right now. Uh, there's some, uh, but uh, we need massive manufacturing volumes in order to get the prices down. Uh, and low manufacturing volumes are always keeping prices high. And then uh, this is particularly suitable for developing countries, uh, and there's a lack of capital in the developing countries. But this, these problems, I think, are all fixable with investment and political will. And so we're hoping that uh, you know, we will get to a point where um, small wind is, uh, is a viable market uh, for folks. Okay. So we take questions after Ryan's talk? Yeah, OK, great. Ryan, you're on. Well, good afternoon, all. It's a uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, in my 20 minutes, I'm going to really shift gears uh, rather dramatically to discuss the uh, current status of the wind market and the future prospects of the wind market, but focusing not on the smaller scale uh, turbines uh, that Glenn described, but rather much larger utility scale uh, turbines that currently represent the bulk of the aggregate wind power market. Um, it's important to recognize that, uh, that these turbines are much, much uh, more sizable, not only than the smaller turbines that Glenn's describing, but also than many of the turbines that perhaps many of you are familiar with from the Altamont Pass. Uh, these are turbines that now typically stand on towers of about 80 meters in height, and they have wingspans of around 80 meters in height as well on average. So think of effectively pretty close to a football field of wingspan and almost a football uh, field's worth of, of hub height as well. These are absolutely massive machines. So for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to cover uh, two sort of three topics. Uh, the first one, a uh, quick description of the current status of the U.S. wind power market in these utility scale applications. I'll then talk about uh, some analysis that we did now a couple of years ago that have analyzed uh, the prospects of achieving much higher levels of wind penetration, 20% by 2030, uh, in the U.S. wind market. And then I'll conclude with just a single slide that describes some of the market and policy needs that might be uh, essential to overcome or to meet in order to achieve higher levels of wind penetration. Uh, most of this presentation is based on two reports. Uh, one over here on the left will be coming out in a couple of weeks. The other one on the right uh, done uh, or completed a couple of years ago. Uh, if you want more information, I can certainly pass on at least this one now, this one in a couple of weeks. So starting with uh, current status of the wind power market, uh, that market has, as you can see on, on this graphic, uh, seen a very significant growth over the last decade or so. About 10 gigawatts of wind uh, were installed in the U.S. in the year 2009. That represents roughly $21 billion of investment and resulted in an aggregate wind power capacity at the end of last year of about 31 gigawatts. Uh, that put the U.S. Uh, in the lead globally in terms of cumulative installed wind power capacity. Again, 35 gigawatts, as you can see here, China in second place couple European countries after that. Uh, the U.S. also, until last year, for about four years running, four, four years running, uh, the U.S. led in annual capacity installations as well. But last year, we were surpassed by China. This year, we will be probably doubled by China uh, at, at the very least. But the U.S. certainly is in strong position to remain in that second spot globally uh, for many years to come. Uh, in addition, oh, you can't really see the... Uh, the legend here for whatever reason. Uh, the important point here is that wind now represents a significant fraction of the newly installed wind power capacity in the United States. Of all the new electric power capacity added in the U.S. in the year, this is 2009, just trust me, 39% uh, of it was wind. 
In 2008, well, you can't see the label here either, 44% of the capacity added in the U.S. was wind, 35% in uh, 07, 18, 06, 12, 2, et cetera, et cetera. So compared to natural gas, which is the blue portion of these bars, uh, wind is the second largest source of new electric capacity additions uh, for a uh, number of years running and now represents a very sizable fraction of the new capacity coming online in the U.S. And so it's no longer really to call this an alternative power source uh, in some sense. If anything, maybe we can call coal an alternative power source. Wind has beaten coal for many years uh, running in terms of new capacity additions in the U.S. Coal is this uh, brown area. Uh, in terms of the geographic spread uh, of, of the market, a pretty significant geographic spread, uh, the uh, exception being the southeastern U.S. where there is effectively no wind uh, or very little on land or onshore wind at least. But you can see significant uh, capacity additions in the middle part of the country, the wind belt of the U.S., but also pretty significant capacity along the Pacific uh, Coast states as well as portions of the Northeast as well. Um, all of these projects to date have been located on land. Um, however, uh, there are a number of projects being planned uh, or at least proposed uh, offshore in the U.S. There are 13 projects that are in more advanced stages of, of development, most of them in the Northeast, the Great Lakes area. Uh, we sort of expect to see at least some of these units being constructed over the next several years, though the economics of offshore wind are not currently nearly as attractive as for onshore wind. So uh, what's driving the growth? Well, pretty simple, uh, economics and policy. On the economics front, uh, wind does in most locations, not everywhere, but most locations, uh, wind is the lowest cost renewable option that is available. Uh, in addition to that, for much of the 2000s, wind was pretty darn competitive with new natural gas and coal power stations. And so the economic positioning of wind, both relative to other renewables and relative to some of the conventional energy sources, the fossil energy sources, is pretty good. Uh, in addition to that, wind certainly benefits from a number of favorable uh, federal policies uh, and state policies, federal tax incentives, a variety of Recovery Act programs that were initiated uh, last year, uh, state renewable energy programs and policies of various forms, and perhaps in the future, state, regional, and federal carbon policies as well. Uh, as a result of those drivers, and because many of those drivers are expected to continue for at least uh, the near to medium term future, there is an enormous amount of wind in the development pipeline. Uh, one of the first things that if you're a wind developer you've got to do is figure out whether you can access the transmission system uh, that is located uh, near or adjacent to your wind power facility. And that means going into the transmission interconnection queue. Basically, putting your project into a study process to analyze the feasibility and cost of interconnecting with the transmission grid. At the end of 2009, there were 300 gigawatts of wind power capacity in transmission interconnection queues across this nation. Uh, that is three times the amount of natural gas that is seeking transmission interconnection. It is a heck of a lot higher than coal, nuclear, solar, uh, and other technologies. Not all of this capacity is going to be built. Certainly a lot of these projects are speculative, but it gives you a sense of the amount of developer interest, at least, in expanding uh, the wind power market in the coming years. Despite all of that, uh, let me be very clear. Wind is certainly a rising, but it is still also a relatively modest contributor to U.S. electricity supply. Uh, this is a graphic that shows the proportion of electricity load in a variety of countries uh, that are met by wind or that could be met with the wind power capacity installed at the end of 2009. And you can see the U.S. stands at about 2.5%. About 2.5% of our electric power supply uh, is met with wind uh, in the U.S. Not too shabby, but it's still 2.5%. We've got a long ways to go for this to be a major contributor to overall electricity production in the U.S. You can also see that that compares with around 20% for Denmark, uh, above 10% uh, in Portugal and Spain, uh, and above 5% uh, in a couple of other countries, uh, mostly European, all European countries, as shown there on the left. Uh, so given that, given that context of a rapidly growing market, but also a market that still only represents 2.5% of U.S. electricity supply, uh, I now like to turn to an analysis of 
the technical and economic feasibility of achieving much higher levels uh, of wind electricity penetration, and specifically 20% wind electricity penetration in the U.S. by the year uh, 2030. Uh, this, again, is an analysis that now is, I guess, two years old. It was completed in July 2008, uh, as I vaguely recall. Um, that said, it's still relatively current. Uh, still, certainly, most of the assumptions that were embedded in that analysis are, are still appropriate. And this analysis still serves as really a, a, the backbone of a lot of the investment decisions that both the Department of Energy is making at the present time, but also that the wind industry uh, is making as well. So uh, in doing this analysis, we uh, had a number of objectives, but specifically we were trying to answer the questions that are listed here. Is it technically feasible to achieve 20% wind by the year 2030? Uh, what might the electricity system look like in achieving such a penetration target? Uh, what costs might be incurred and what benefits achieved from achieving such an aggressive target? Uh, and finally, what challenges exist to achieving uh, that, that target. I'm not going to talk about all of the analytical details here. This would bore uh, you and would probably bore me as well, uh, but I do want to highlight some of the key results from this particular uh, piece of work. Uh, the first one, and, and this should be rather self-evident, uh, is that achieving 20% wind uh, requires a dramatic increase in wind power capacity. I mentioned earlier that in the year 2009, we added roughly 10 gigawatts of wind capacity, resulting in uh, 30 gigawatts total capacity in the U.S. The particular scenario that we were analyzing, the glide path to get us to 20% uh, to wind, requires us to ramp up that capacity growth to about 16 gigawatts a year. Not that much greater than 10 gigawatts, but still... Uh, a lift, and then sustain that growth for uh, a lengthy period uh, of time until we reached 300 gigawatts of aggregate capacity, about 10 times what we currently see in the U.S. Now, uh, one might be a little bit concerned about manufacturing and materials constraints to such a scenario. Uh, we don't find really any significant manufacturing and materials constraints. Uh, however, in ramping up the sector at that pace, we're going to have to be very careful uh, to allow uh, costs not to rise along with demand. Over the last couple of years, in fact, the cost of wind energy has increased. Over the last five years or so, the cost of wind energy has increased, and it's largely because the amount of capacity growth, the amount of demand, has exceeded available uh, supply. And so we need to be very careful in managing this ramp up to keep the, the costs and prices of wind to a reasonable level. Uh, the good news is that, that we certainly in the U.S. have more than adequate uh, wind resource to meet this target. The U.S. has the best wind resource in the world. Uh, this slide shows that if you ignore the production tax credit, one of the major federal incentives for wind, if you ignore transmission and integration costs, so you're just looking at the cost at the generation bus bar, let's say, um, that we have about 8,000 gigawatts of wind power capacity potentially available for utilization at a cost of under 9 U.S. cents Per, per kilowatt hour. To get to 20% wind, as I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, you need uh, 300 gigawatts of wind. So we only need a little teeny sliver of the available uh, reasonably economic resource in order to achieve 20% wind in the U.S. That's not to say that there won't be challenges. I'll be talking about the challenges here in a moment. Uh, but the wind resource itself is not a fundamental barrier to achieving a 20% uh, scenario. Uh, siting and permitting will no doubt be a significant challenge. Uh, 300 gigawatts of wind is a lot. Uh, siting and permitting challenges already exist for uh, the existing fleet of wind projects, and those siting and permitting challenges, though they are perhaps more institutional than technical in nature, uh, still are likely to be rather substantial. Um, our modeling gives us some indication of uh, at least one example of where the wind plants might be located, both within the U.S. You can see that in this slide. The darker colors are areas where our model is predicting a greater quantity of wind, and also offshore and onshore. You can see that our model is predicting about 50 gigawatts of the 300 gigawatts coming from offshore wind. This is just one scenario. It's a modeling result. This is not necessarily exactly where the wind facilities will be located, but it gives you a sense for the geographic distribution. In terms of the aggregate land area required to host these turbines represents, if you added it all up and had it in one contiguous area, which of course you would not, about 140 uh, mile by 140 mile uh, square. Of that area, about 2 to 5 percent is actually used by the turbines themselves. The other stuff is the spacing, effectively, among the turbines and retains its 
potentially original use, whether farmland, ranching land, or otherwise. Uh, transmission is also uh, a major, major issue. Uh, the truth is people don't want to live where it's windy, and the wind isn't where people live as a result of this. The wind exists a lot in North Dakota and South Dakota. Well, there's not too many people in North Dakota and South Dakota. So we need to have major transmission investment to bring uh, areas where we have low-cost wind resources and to bring those electrons to load centers. Um, the red lines here represent one very broadly um, suggestive scenario of the general locations of where transmission would be needed. If you're actually going to build transmission for 20% wind, you'd build an integrated grid, or at least you'd like to build an integrated grid. You might not be able to achieve that politically. So this is just a modeling result. It gives you some sense of the magnitude of the, uh, the investment needed and the scale of the challenge. Fortunately, though, while this is certainly a major institutional challenge, the good news is that transmission is really not that expensive to build. It's hard to build. It's hard to figure out how to pay the cost. You know, should it be North Dakota or should it be Minnesota that pays costs for lines that go across states, things of this nature? Major institutional challenge. But the actual cost of building transmission uh, is not, not that high. Uh, in our modeling, we found that all of these red lines would cost roughly uh, uh, I think $60 billion uh, total dollars. Uh, that's a, a sizable sum relative to all of our salaries combined. Uh, but relative to the electricity sector, it's not that great. That $60 billion represents effectively uh, a 10 to 20% adder to the cost of building the wind machines themselves. It's not an insignificant sum, but it's not a, a massive additional cost compared to the wind turbines themselves. Um, Wind is variable. It can't be predicted uh, with precision. And so this is oftentimes mentioned as, as a real concern. And it is a concern uh, for the electric power uh, sector. Um, our analysis, though, building off of what have been now dozens of very detailed wind integration studies that have been conducted by electric utilities, independent system operators, and others uh, across the, the nation, and in fact, internationally, over the last number of years, finds that these concerns can largely be addressed through institutional changes in the way we operate our electric power system and through increased investments in principally natural gas uh, combustion turbines. Um, you can see in this graphic, or maybe you can't if you're in the back row, uh, that as expected, in the 20% wind scenario, you get a lot more wind, the gold bar, than you did in the no wind scenario. Well, in that scenario, you get no wind. Uh, and you can see that additional wind offsets New coal, new coal plants drop in capacity substantially. Similarly, uh, new uh, gas combined cycle plants drop as well. But gas combustion turbines, these are the flexible natural gas units that are used to ramp up and down and meet reliability constraints, uh, increase. Storage, storage is always an interesting topic. There is no doubt that storage would benefit this scenario. However, nothing in our, in our analysis suggests that it is uh, impossible to achieve 20% wind without increased investments uh, in storage. In fact, what we find is that storage represents among the most costly options of managing the variability of wind. That's not to say that it's not valuable. That's not to say that if we can bring the cost down, that it wouldn't be a useful uh, solution to have in the basket of solutions that are available. But what we find is that 20% wind penetration, at least, there are other cheaper alternatives to managing the variability of wind. OK, so perhaps there are no fundamental technical constraints. Operationally, it's hard, but it's doable. Transmission, institutional challenge, and perhaps some cost challenges, but not fundamentally uh, impossible. Manufacturing and materials constraints uh, perhaps aren't uh, enormous uh, either. But what are we going to have to pay? Right? I mean, wind costs potentially more than alternative resources. What are we going to have to pay? So we did a lot of analysis on this issue. Of course, the analysis is driven by, you know, Tons of assumptions, uh, uh, all of which someone will disagree with, but were the to the best of our abilities represented reasonable assumptions at the time. Uh, and what we found in that analysis is that our 20% wind scenario uh, cost roughly $43 billion more in present value, discounted present value terms, to our no wind uh, scenario. That represents for an average residential homeowner in the US uh, about a, a 50 cent uh, per month extra cost uh, of achieving this scenario relative to a no, a no new wind scenario. So uh, not seemingly an exorbitant cost uh, under this specific set of assumptions. Again, 
uh, important to note that one could have different assumptions and one would therefore obviously have different results. Uh, with that cost, a number of benefits might be uh, accrued, lower carbon emissions, uh, reduced pr prices for fossil fuels, additional price stability, environmental improvements, reduced uh, water consumption, uh, a variety of other things as well. Uh, given the, the carbon spack down uh, topic of today, let me just focus uh, on carbon. Um, the 20% win scenario, this blue line represents sort of the reference case scenario. You know, if we did nothing about carbon, what would the U.S. electricity sector contribute towards CO2 emissions uh, in the U.S. over the coming uh, 20 years or so? Uh, this goldish bar, whatever color that is, uh, represents the 20% wind scenario. About a 20% reduction in carbon emissions. This is not a silver bullet. You know, to solve the climate uh, issue, we're going to need to have a trajectory that's much below this, but it represents a significant fraction of the necessary investments needed to begin to decarbonize the U.S. electric power sector. Okay, uh, let me end with, with just one final slide. Uh, the market and policy needs for achieving uh, higher levels uh, of wind power penetration. Uh, and let me just leave you with some relatively uh, broad uh, thoughts. Uh, the first, of course, not surprisingly, is that some form of long-term policy is going to be necessary. Whether that policy focuses on low carbon technologies in general, or whether that economic policy is targeted specifically at renewable energy or specifically at wind, probably doesn't matter that much for wind. Wind is among the lower cost renewable options. It's among the lower cost electricity supply options uh, that can uh, reduce uh, carbon emissions. And so whether it's a renewables policy or a carbon policy may not matter all that much. We just need an aggressive policy one way or the other. Uh, in addition to that, though, the transmission barrier is going to be significant. New policy in that area would be essential. Uh, proactive efforts to manage winds variability uh, certainly uh, will be important. And given rising concerns about siting and permitting these facilities. These are very, very sizable machines. They are visible uh, in the landscape. Uh, they have environmental impacts like any uh, activity by humankind. Uh, and these are, are issues also that will have to be addressed. And with that, let me conclude. Thanks. Uh, I have a couple of questions. I guess I wanted to focus on the connection between the two talks. Um, first, I didn't understand why the first talk was titled Urban Wind Turbines. Certainly, I couldn't fit that in my house. I don't know how many people here can fit that in their house. But well, no. what do you mean by there fits it? It can go right up next to your house, no problem. No. <laughs> yeah, I mean okay, well, house. yeah, a lot of, there's a lot of houses where it can uh, fit, I think. Uh, right. And the other is. Yeah. If you're thinking if of I, apartment building levels. Yeah, stuff, if I understand yeah. correctly, um, you said class two, right, for the that's first. That's the design point for it to start to become economical. Uh, and then you show that, the second talk showed a plot of available wind uh, for exploitation. Class two wasn't even on that plot. Which, it started at class which three. Which plot? There was a plot. Yeah. I, was that in Ryan's talk? No, no, I think it was the one where you showed uh, energy production by wind resource class for your machine. Right. I think that's probably what you're yeah, referring to, yeah. Yeah, there was. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there was. Well, we, we can go back and look at it, but class two is about 5.1 meters a second. Uh, oh, oh, you mean how much energy is produced? That's, that's the reference point of, uh, of 4,400 or so kilowatt hours per year at class two. I think he wants to know how okay. much class two is available. Oh, is available. Okay, so that's a different map totally that I didn't show at all. And uh, there's uh, local class two along basically coastal California and ridgeline California, as I mentioned, uh, a fair amount of it. Yeah, the important thing to note here is that you know, as you go down in class, you're going down in wind speed. And so you have more and more land area at lower classes. And so really the objective is to be as economic as possible in lower, wi lower wind classes. And that's true for, for small wind and, and large wind, for that matter, mm -hmm. uh, as well. I mean, there's only so many sites that are near transmission, don't have major siting issues, and are class seven sites. I mean, there's just there's not that many of them out there. And so you want to go to lower, lower classes. How far you know, we go for small wind and large wind is going to vary. vary up, 
people's perspectives. And obviously, as you go to lower classes, the economics get more challenging. The amount of land area that's potentially available grows uh, very, very sizably as you go to lower wind resource classes. But whether you can do that economically is, is an open question. Right. And, and I might mention that uh, that's sort of the vision for the individual consumer choice, you know, to the person who lives in a reasonably windy area making the choice to put a turbine up. And of course, you have to have the space to do it. And if you don't, uh, you don't. And, uh, but there's large areas of the world in the trade winds, for example, large populations of the world where there's, you know, class five, six winds uh, in, around there. I was, just, I was just someplace where there is, you know, and they're very interested in the development of this technology. Yeah. Uh, I wonder what the design life of a wind system is. Is it, is it this on the order of 10 years, 20 years? 20 years. years. 20 years was the, uh, for the, you're talking about the small turbines? Uh, yeah, I'm just yeah. wondering, because of, you know, centripetal forces on the mm -hmm. veins, I would assume it would be uh, almost a complete rebuild of the system, wouldn't it, after some? Uh, we think, uh, well, this is one of the things that we're determining, okay? We'll be making measurements rather than calculations of what the stress levels are, and so those will feed back. But the original design was done for a 20-year lifetime, uh, and uh, they used, uh, you know, the germanster lloyd uh, criteria. Uh, in their design. Now, we have to verify that and go back and bring actual experimental data into it, which is why you know, we're doing a little tweaking on uh, the uh, rotor uh, positioning of the weight and things like that. And but but that's, that's the, the design lifetime is you know, going to be much longer than, say, the battery swapping out lifetime. If you're doing a battery charger, you're going to be swapping batteries you know, every two or three years. And uh, there will be some maintenance also. Uh, but, for large wind, the, the IEC design life for a turbine is 20 years. Uh, in practice, sometimes blades last a year, sometimes they last 20 years, sometimes gearboxes last 15 years, sometimes they last one year, three months. Uh, there's a lot of reliability issues that still uh, have to be addressed. I mean, the amount of forces uh, on these machines are, are enormous. The amount of scale up and the size of the machines uh, is, is incredible. And so uh, there's still a lot of effort out there to, to try to increase the reliability, especially in an offshore wind environment where access becomes a major issue. So if something goes wrong, it might be out there going wrong for a period of time before you're able to get out there and service it. Right. And I might make, make a point on that is that uh, we'll have, you know, vibration sensors in the unit that automatically throw the brakes. It'll be on its own dedicated circuit so that if, you know, something starts to go wrong, you know, the brakes fire on the unit and, and it shuts itself down. But, you know, what, what you might design for installation in a class two unit would be a different you know, we want to beef it up for a class seven unit, you know, because uh, we just need a lifetime. And so it can be beefed up. You know. Earlier this week, Saul Griffith was here and he was talking about his high altitude designs. I'm curious what both of you think about that concept with these tethered systems and whether you think there's really a future there or not. Um, I, I've done no technical analysis uh, on this issue, but. Um, the wind turbines that we're currently deploying in the U.S. Uh, are cost competitive to reasonably mature technology. Uh, the amount of technical risk is, is relatively low. And I think it will be very difficult for uh, technologists and investors to move towards a higher risk proposition when you have a low risk, relatively low cost option that's already being deployed uh, at scale. Um, in addition to that, because wind is relatively low cost, I think from a carbon reduction perspective, one might anticipate that we'll see significant growth in the relatively near term. But at a certain point, the electric power system just is not going to be able to want to handle a lot more variable resources, absent having storage. Up to 20 percent, that's not an issue, but eventually that becomes an issue. And so I think one of the, the risks for uh, some of the, the more exotic or advanced technologies is that by the time they're ready for commercial deployment, you kind of wonder how much market is there left within at least the U.S. electric power sector. And that's not something that they can control. It's not something I can control. It's only something that Congress or the President can control at some level with the policies necessary to, to bring wind uh, penetration higher. Uh, but it's certainly something to, to think about. Right. I'm all for doing what we know how to do right now. <laughs> Um, so my question is, why do vertical axis wind turbines not scale? Um, so do you have a problem making really big ones? Uh, no. As a matter of fact, there was a rumor that the Chinese had a gigawatt unit running um, at 48 miles an hour wind or something. Uh, they do scale. Uh, and uh, I think uh, 
they're not competitive on terrestrial based loca uh, locations, I don't think, in terms of cost with the, the current horizontal technology. But the question, I think, is open for offshore. And, and you know, there's a lot of offshore energy, and there's some advantages uh, that they may have in offshore environments. Yeah, you've got but to, they, they scale to large sizes. Yeah. I mean, you've got to get to elevation to get the higher winds. And so onshore, there's quite a lot of wind shear. And so mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the horizontal axis machine has some, have some inherent advantages there and also some just inherent efficiency advantages over vertical axis. Offshore, there's less wind shear. You don't have to have, don't have to go as high. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the vertical axis machines have some potential there. Uh, I think you can answer this question to some extent, though, in the same way as the previous one, which is if you got a technology that's reasonably mature and working, it's going to be, wh whatever the technical merits mm -hmm. of a new machine, whatever the ultimate economic merits uh, of a new machine, it's going to be a tough push just from a, an investment and financing perspective, given the additional risk and given the fact that you've got machines already being deployed by the existing sector that are working reasonably well. So I certainly agree that, that vertical axis can, can scale. Uh, and the offshore market is one where there may be some interest there, not just for vertical axis, but some other more exotic or different designs uh, for, for wind as well. But there is an investment and financing challenge. Um, that's not insubstantial. Yeah, exactly. That's the big uh, problem. And what we're dealing with in the small turbines is individual consumer choices. You know, do you buy a Mercedes or do you, do, do you buy a Prius? I mean, you know, and and so people make decisions based on what it how it affects them. Uh, you know, what the noise environment might be, whether they like the looks. You know, all this stuff is kind of individual choice. And so, uh, what we're doing is working with something that's particularly no, low noise, and and that's the key. key. Um, this sounds like a very noble effort. Um, you said that we're trying to achieve 20% of U.S. energy needs in 20 years at $60 billion. Uh, 300 million people in the United States, that works out to $200 per person or $10 per year per person. Yes. <laughs> Let's go do it. <laughs> Are you thinking we should go beyond 20%? Uh, the the yeah. 20% is something that we, we analyzed. Uh, and we analyzed it because uh, you know, this was during a, a prior administration. And the president of that administration uttered in a speech, 20% wind is possible. And we figured uh, you know, if he could utter it, we could, we could analyze it. Um, and so that's what we did. There's nothing magical about 20%. Uh, certainly others have analyzed higher percentages, but to get to a higher percentage, you kind of have to start at a lower percentage. So uh, I'm not saying that there's any sort of fundamental technical barrier to achieving any level of penetration. We can get to 100% penetration. Now then we really need storage. Yeah. <laughs> then we really need storage. Um, there's no technical limit. It's all an economic limit. And so we were, we were trying to understand whether you get to 20% wind, uh, but, but there's no reason that that is an endpoint. And, and the storage issue is, you know, fascinating. I mean, in the Cape Verde Islands, they're doing an entire island that's all renewable energy. And they have big wind turbines, and they're pumping water back uphill so they can run it down, you know, uh, in off wind times uh, to run a hydroelectric, uh, uh, normal hydroelectric facility. And so, you know, there's, there's lots of options. But if, you know, if, if you can connect to the grid and get 20%, you know, wow, let's just go do it. Yeah. Hi. Uh, just storage. some quick questions on advances and challenges in the areas of noise and the environmental impact. So what are some of the trends and things that you've seen recently? I know that, for example, active control was being looked at for noise on the big, on the big blades, things like that. Yeah. So I'll start with large, and then you, know, you can fill in on the small. Um, yeah, the large wind turbines, I mean, noise is not an issue in a lot of parts of the country, right? I mean, you can build stuff in the middle of North Dakota where there's nobody around, and, and noise just isn't an issue. Um, but it is a very significant siting issue, especially in the Northeast, the upper Midwest, wherever there's population density near wind projects. Uh, these machines make noise. Uh, and there are some pretty highly publicized examples where uh, those, those noise impacts are significant for individuals, especially individuals that are pretty sensitive to, to sound. Um, to, at, at, at a certain level, there's not much you can do. These are moving machines. They're going to make noise. Um, there are operational strategies that can be used to reduce uh, noise levels, basically scaling back turbine output. There's certainly some technical advances in terms of airfoil design that are being looked at. Uh, as well, but you have to be careful not to reduce the efficiency too much. I mean, it's a trade-off, right? Uh, and so there may be certain designs that are better for 
areas where you need to have low noise, others that might be better uh, in, in environments where higher noise levels are, are allowable. Um, the other thing I would note is that we're beginning to understand more and more over the specific noise profile of wind projects. Um, wind projects are, it, it, we find, substantially more annoying at a certain decibel level than many other sources of noise. Um, and so trying to understand the level of annoyance associated with, with wind turbines and therefore what are the appropriate regulations to try to mitigate those impacts is also an issue of, of high concern. Yeah, I hate to say that people live next to the L in Chicago, but they do. Uh, <laughs> and they seem to learn how to live with it. But the, the issue is exactly goes back to this curve that I showed of tip speed ratio, right? Which is why we went way down to 2.5 in tip speed ratio is, is that the blades are moving 65 miles an hour max and they're quiet there, okay? But if you're running at 200, you have an issue to deal with. And, and I think Ryan just laid out all the trade-offs that are involved in that. Yeah. And we have time for one more quick question. I wanted to ask, for the large-scale turbines, to say we did get to 20 percent of our electricity generated, looking across the whole country, what kind of capacity factor would that represent? Yeah, so um, average wind project installed today uh, in the U.S. achieves capacity factors of you know, 30 to 35 percent. Um, some regions in the country, it's below that. Some parts of, uh, you know, Parts of Texas, other places get up to 45% uh, capacity factors. Um, the question ultimately is that we've got lots of wind resource that can get 35% capacity factor. Um, the problem is that much of those resources are not located where people are. And so it ends up being an economic decision for the Northeast. Do you take lower quality wind resources that don't require as much transmission mm -hmm. or higher quality wind resources that do require a lot of transmission, bring it in from North Dakota to, to New York, or do you go offshore? And so these are economic choices, economic choices that will also be driven by political factors. Uh, northeastern states, even though it might be cheaper to build a big, long extension line to North Dakota, might say, you know, what are we getting out of this big, long extension line? How about we build this stuff off of our shoreline and get some of the economic development benefits of, of doing so? So that's one of the big challenges there. So we could get to 20% wind energy with 35 40% capacity factor sites. We probably won't because we'll choose to locate some of the projects closer to load centers. And just to follow up on your comment too also is, is that it turns out the turbine typically is the, one of the lowest cost items in the system. <laughs> you know, the, it's the tower, it's the site and, and all this. And so this is all part of the economics that, you know, Ryan's talking about is, is that uh, the bigger investment is actually in the siting and, uh, you know, uh, getting from the site. And which turbine you choose then is kind of well, the very top of it, I guess, right? Good, thank you. Um, yeah. Thanks again to yeah. Glenn and Ryan.